leak has to be in the pulmonary veins. They're getting my lungs, right? I don't see anything. Do you? No. Sorry, I didn't know there was anyone. We're just here to help Stevie. Who's Stevie? This patient's very curious. He knows a lot about science. It seems that his parents don't live at the address that he gave the team, and the team can't call them. Very excited to be reacting to House MD Season 3, Episode 13, Needle in a Haystack, recommended by our first ever Omega Channel member, Laszlo Cosma. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before House does as a doctor working in London. On this channel, we're on a mission to react to all House episodes, and this would be 30 out of 177. Stevie? What's wrong? Oh my god! Help! Someone help me! I can already tell this episode's gonna be interesting, but this is the second time House has opened with a guy getting severely unwell during sex. Your sacrifice will not be forgotten. Interestingly, the animal kingdom takes it one step further with a male colluter that dies shortly after mating. Wait, there's more. This is so common in the animal kingdom that it's actually got a name, semilparity. They're not quite sure why this happens, but there are a few theories like number one, the female and young are more likely to survive if the male's not taking up food and space, or two, it's just an accidental quirk of nature, or like for the dark fishing spider, the male actually becomes dinner for the female after mating. Yum. If you see a fork on the bedside table, guys, run. So it looks like our patient's throat is closing up. Could be because of an allergy or a severe asthma attack. Let's find out more. 16 year old with respiratory arrest. ER workup revealed a bloody pleural effusion. No tumors or pneumonia on the CT. This is not a high pressure burst, it's a low pressure leak. Diagnostically spicy case. So we know so far that he's had a respiratory arrest. They found blood in his chest. Chase seems to think it was drugs, particularly cocaine, that led to a bleed, but the tox screen was clean. The team seemed to think there are no signs of asthma or allergy, and CT showed no tumors or pneumonia. House seems to think it's a bleed, but not an aneurysm bursting, and so wants a venogram, not an arteriogram. So there are a few things to clarify here. One, we don't really know if this is blood yet since we can't really be sure without taking a sample and it seems like they haven't done that. Two, if this blood was large enough to cause a respiratory arrest in a 16 year old, it must be filling up his entire chest on one side, meaning it's huge and an emergency chest drain needs putting in. The most common cause of something like that in a young patient would be trauma. You would expect to see signs of that on a CT though, like a rib fracture. Since that's not present, it makes me think either he has a bleeding disorder or it isn't actually blood. I would want to drain the fluid, see what it looks like. If it's not blood, I would send it to the lab to see if it's exudate or transudate. That helps you narrow down the causes of whether it could be something like heart failure or something like infection. While all this is happening, House is angry because there's a new doctor who seems to have taken his parking spot. See if he's got any pills or powders stashed with a hand lotion. Let me have my space back. Wheelchair. Cane. Pushing that little lever, muscles must burn. Crossing the parking lot's dangerous. Wow, they're in a war of disabilities for who is more disabled. Obviously, they both have a need here, and I don't envy the person that has to make this choice. But it is interesting here, and I love to see that the workplace is adapting to try and support both of them overcome their disabilities so they can use their skills and talents to contribute. The way systems in developed countries are set up is in a way that you're either considered disabled or not. But where do you set the line for what constitutes a disability and what doesn't? Also, why is it so binary when the range of disabilities is huge? Disabilities can be physical, intellectual, mental health related, or sensory. Giving people the disabled label can take away from their confidence when self-confidence might be just what is needed for them to be able to use their talents with adaptations to suit them. There is a great pool of talent and creativity among the disabled. Nobel Prize winner John Nash suffered from acute paranoid schizophrenia for the majority of his life and is a subject of a movie called A Beautiful Mind. If you haven't seen that, definitely recommend watching it. It's a great film. Frida Kahlo was in severe pain and in bed for most of her life, having contracted polio and been in an accident in her younger years. 
and yet she's one of the most famous artists of all time and is an icon of the 20th century. Stephen Hawking is one of the most celebrated physicists for his contribution to black hole theory and had motor neuron disease. It's so inspiring hearing about all of their stories and hoping there will be many more for us in the future. Leak has to be in the pulmonary veins. They're getting my lungs, right? I don't see anything, do you? No. Sorry, I didn't know there was anyone. We're just here to help Stevie. Who's Stevie? This patient's very curious. He knows a lot about science. It seems that his parents don't live at the address that he gave the team, and the team can't call them. He's 16, so the team haven't been able to get parental consent for his procedure, so Foreman just decided to go ahead anyway and deal with the consequences afterwards in classic house fashion. Interestingly though, in the UK, a minor can actually consent for themselves because of something called Gillick competence. It was named after the Gillick family who tried to sue a healthcare organization for giving their daughter contraception when she was under the age of 16 and the court ruled in the healthcare organization's failure. Pretty brutal losing a case and then having the precedent named after you forever. So now they're trying to rename it to Fraser Guidelines. They basically say that if a minor wants to consent to a procedure, they can as long as they're over 12 and they meet requirements for capacity, which is being able to understand, weigh up, retain, and convey the information. He's lying. He's Romani. A gypsy. You can't go to my house. You're polluted. I'll tell you whatever you need to know. Okay, I've smoked pot. Oh, this patient is part of the Romani community, which have a very rich and interesting history. Although filled with persecution, even the word gypsy was originally used to express disapproval of the group because of their mistaken identity. It was thought that they were from Egypt rather than their actual origin, India. The Romani are a traveling population with a strong sense of mysticism who practice things like fortune telling regularly. The stories of their magical abilities include love spells, charms, recovery of stolen property, and protection of livestock. So it's not incomprehensible here that this patient's fixed beliefs that others entering his home would pollute it is rooted in mysticism rather than psychosis, although the two can be hard to distinguish sometimes, especially since smoking pot is a risk factor for psychosis in itself, but that wouldn't cause the fluid in his chest, which still hasn't been drained. Very surprising he's not got a chest drain. The pot wouldn't cause a bleeding problem. A pesticide on the pot could. What else are you lying about? Is your father really a professor? He's a salesman. He was just in Chicago. A week ago. Okay, some very interesting clues here. This child's parents made him drop out of school, so he is homeschooled. He got pot from his girlfriend, but the most interesting thing is that he had some recent travel to Chicago with his dad. Now, house is set in Princeton Plainsboro Hospital, which is an 11 and a half hour drive to Chicago. The kid said they went on his dad's truck. That gives us some serious clues. One thing I would worry about after travel that long is a pulmonary embolism. A clot in the lung could cause pulmonary hemorrhage, although if it were big enough to cause respiratory arrest, you would usually see some lung had died on the CT or the X-ray. We call that a wedge infarction. A CTPA, which is angiography, will definitely be able to show the clot itself. That would be really interesting because House made Foreman do a venogram instead of an arteriogram at the beginning. And if that arteriogram showed the clot, that would be spicy. Other causes could be something like Henoch Schonlein purpura, a clotting dysfunction, pneumothorax, aortic dissection. Now, interestingly, he is part of the traveling community, so he'd be at a higher risk of things like tuberculosis. So that would definitely be in the differential. But here is a question for you smart people. What things can increase the chances of a blood clot? Whoever lists the most gets a shout out in the next video. Huge shout out to Ruda who got 21 steroid side effects and is also a channel member. Good work. We should do an arteriogram, find the clot, bust it with TPA. Then his blood, redo the venogram. I thought you were redoing the venogram. As soon as we're done with the arteriogram. You're gonna feel a little poke. Wait, what is she threading there? Whatever this technique doesn't get used anymore. Imaging of the pulmonary arteries and veins can be used by an injection of IV contrast simply into a cannula site. The timing of the contrast compared to when the CT is taken is really important. 
For the arteries, it would be earlier than the veins. After the images are taken, they can reconstruct the beautiful Venus tree that you saw earlier using 3D rendering tech. Pretty amazing when you think about it. Oh, my stomach. I sweat. Oh, no, I can't. It hurts too much. The guy's going into his liver, but it's not coming out. His whole liver's fried. How can he have both a bleed and a clot? It's not a clot. He must have blocked the vein with a catheter wire. It seems like this patient has something called Bud Chiari syndrome, where you get post-hepatic obstruction of blood flow. There are really two main causes of that. It can either be a clot or a mass that is compressing the hepatic veins. Now, Foreman asked a really good question, which is, how is he bleeding and has a clot at the same time? Well, the likelihood is he isn't. Since we haven't even confirmed that it's blood in his chest, it's probably not. The second thing is that every time they do the pulmonary arteriogram, something seems to stop them. So here's my theory. He has a mass blocking the outflow of the liver, probably because he has some kind of dye or carcinogen exposure from his dad selling anything he can get his hands on. That mass leads him to being in a hypercoagulable state. Then he goes on his trip to Chicago, sitting in the back of a pickup truck for over 10 hours, and that causes a clot in his legs, which flies up to his lungs and causes a pulmonary embolism, leads to the blood in his chest. Let's see. Just a theory. Cancer. That tumor could erode a blood vessel. Well, so could a granuloma from tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. So a CT, MRI, sputum, and an ACE level. Wait. Is that a lesion? It's a granuloma. Interesting. So my mass theory was right, but it seems like it's a granuloma, which is caused by a special type of immune response. That means it could still have a whole host of conditions like TB, sarcoidosis, cancer, vasculitis, allergy, drug reaction. So it doesn't narrow it down much. Besides, if you're wondering why House is in a wheelchair, it's because he wants to prove he can stay in there for seven days and wants his parking spot back. Petty, but effective, I'm sure. I mean, it's Wagner's is most likely. TB. Mom, is that you? Hey, hey. Get him out of this now. Yeah, we need you to leave the room. Start treatment with cyclophosphamide before the Wagner punches a hole in another pipe. Did his parents just burst their way into an MRI room? Very impressive that they even managed to find it since hospitals are about as easy to navigate as a teenage tantrum. Now, back to the patient. How did we know that it was Wagner's granulomatosis and not any of the other causes of granuloma? He's in the traveling community. TB is very common. Could also be aspergillosis or other fungal infections, or infectious mononucleosis with kissing disease, which we know he has the means of transmission since we saw it in the beginning. So starting on one cyclophosphamide, which is an immunosuppressant, while skipping a biopsy is beyond risky. Will it pay off? Now, if you're enjoying the content and want to help me make it better, then check out the channel membership. Not only does it support me a lot, but you also get some very good perks like being able to request series and episode for me to react to, as well as getting early access to videos. For now, I'm giving all new members a shout out on some videos, so make sure to take advantage of that while it's available. And I'm also going to be doing some members only streams shortly. So make sure to secure your spot by clicking join now. Thank you. Where's your soup? It's in the garbage. It has willow bark extract. Willow bark extract is basically aspirin. He doesn't want to hear your talk. We want her out of here. It hurts. No wonder this patient doesn't want the doctors to call his family. He's embarrassed of them. He doesn't believe in their ways and actually loves science yet they're trying to keep him within their circle and he's torn between the two worlds. It's a real cultural challenge and there's even a name for this kind of thing called third culture kids. As an Iraqi origin person who's married a Finnish woman, I worry about my kids actually suffering from these difficulties in identity. I think when a family are so sensitive and closed off about discussing the topic, it can be a really tough thing for a child to navigate. The way the patient's family here are quite overbearing and strict is likely to just push their son away rather than welcome him. Some people need to question while others follow what they're taught. It seems like the patient is the former. About his bleeding, I think it's likely that it's a bladder hemorrhage. The cyclophosphamide can cause acute hemorrhagic cystitis as a side effect, as when it's broken down in the body, it can irritate the kidneys and bladder. Seems like it's not helping him much anyways, so I would definitely want to be doing a biopsy of the lesion, blood tests, and an autoimmune screen as well. Results are 
quick. The Wegner's treatment gave him a massive hemorrhage in his bladder. It's not the wrong diagnosis, it's the wrong treatment. FT28. FT28 is still experimental, it's not FDA approved. My people have been experimenting on before, never again. Not only does House now want to use an experimental treatment for his patient that we're still uncertain of the diagnosis for, but he wants to lie about what the patient has to be able to get his hands on it. House says the treatment is only available for Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis, so they're gonna lie and say he has one of them. In reality, this drug doesn't exist, although immunomodulation and monoclonal antibodies have revolutionized treatment for autoimmune conditions. But they are insanely expensive, with the most expensive being Eculizumab, which costs, wait for it, $409,500 a year for the average patient. Considering that if I lose my arm in a skydiving accident, I get 30,000 pounds. That is a spicy price. I have to ask everyone to leave the room for a few minutes while I apply some bandages. For his penis, take the medicine, but don't tell your parents. Ow, ow. Spleen basically exploded, huh? Oh, splenic rupture, getting worse on immunosuppression, was kissing at the beginning. Come on, tell me this isn't mononucleosis. Do an Epstein bar test. Please. Why does House hate blood tests so much? People in the third world are looking at you like, you have all these fancy tests and you use none of them. The spleen is actually quite an important organ too. It protects the body against encapsulated pathogens by filtering the blood through it and causing the pathogens to come in contact with condensed immune cell units. So patients with no spleen need special vaccinations and lifelong antibiotics to avoid deadly infections. Question for you smart people. What are the names of the encapsulated pathogens? Drop your answers down below. I don't see anything but normal spleen, no granulomas. That's a good thing we never sold them on FD28. His parents were right. Large bowel has fixed the abdominal wall. I didn't run that. Do a colonoscopy. What? So House got up from his wheelchair to start checking the patient's bowel for granulomas and found nothing. Now he's wondering if the answer was hiding away downwind in the large intestine. Seems like the patient narrowly avoided the FD28 Foreman wanted to give him too. Now what if all this time the patient actually had Crohn's disease. The immunosuppressant made his liver better, so autoimmune fits best. Splenic rupture would be a very rare complication, but not unheard of. Doesn't quite explain the needle in the haystack title though. Let's see what's in the colon. I'm in his colon. What's that? Toothpick. He must have swallowed it accidentally. You two were making out in the car. He must have folded awkwardly, pushed the toothpick through the wall of the intestine and into the lung. Swallowed a toothpick. A toothpick. How did he swallow that without noticing? Then became unwell. Then didn't think to mention it. Also, how on earth does a toothpick go through the intestine and puncture the lung? There is a muscular layer between them called the diaphragm. It would need some serious force to get through. Possible but unlikely. What an insane diagnosis. I love it. Explains the needle in the haystack title. Now take that bad boy out. That's it? The lab here. They have a paid intern position. I could probably get you an interview. I can. Yes, you can. Steven, you're bright. I love what Foreman's doing here. Taking a young mind and trying to nurture his enthusiasm and curiosity. This is part of the reason why I love teaching. I find it so satisfying helping other people find something that they're passionate about. Sometimes just a small amount of gentle encouragement is all people need. In my practice, I run tutorials with third year med students and it's a privilege to be able to sit on the other side of all the exams and work as an intern and to give that experience back to them. Very rewarding. I wonder why this patient's not taking him up on this offer though. You have more curiosity than 90% of the doctors on this staff. I go to work every day with my family. I'm gonna lose that. I'm choosing them. Y'all got empty ring fingers. How's Scott's parking back? More importantly, did you see that kid's reply? All you doctors have empty ring fingers. You're all alone. Ah, that's not quite true. But medicine is definitely a sacrifice. And yes, you are told that when you're 18, making a totally informed decision about what to do with the rest of your life. But do we really understand what that sacrifice is before even having a job? Tough ask. The lifestyle does get better as you move on through your training from the start. I was working 80 to 90 hour weeks at one point. Definitely wasn't time for this channel then, but there is now, and that's why you can watch another episode here. Do I get the diagnosis? Find out.
Thanks again to Lazo Cosma for recommending this episode. Stay curious.